Uh, good morning, and um, firstly, thank you to, to Steve Knight uh, and the committee for enabling me to speak to you today. For me personally, it's been a very interesting conference, uh, and I've certainly learned a lot and had many of my uh, perceptions challenged. Um, I think for me, one of the most interesting presentations in that respect was, was actually the last one um, yesterday before we headed off for our um, excellent networking dinner, um, a, talk, a talk by... Our, by Guy from Archipelago. Um, for me, this talk gave a really fascinating insight into the role of charging of droplets in, in piezo inkjet technologies. Um, how many of you were there at, out, out of interest? So good to see a, a good number of you were there. Um, for those that weren't, um, Guy mentioned the fact that um, in, in conventional inkjet printing, actually the, the droplets pick up quite a sizable amount of charge um, and for small droplets, this can be a problem uh, with droplets going back to a nozzle plate. With large droplets it, um, that, meet, that reach the, the substrate, these droplets can move. Um, we were left with a very interesting final question um, from Hamid, actually, which was, um, can we actually use this charged, the charged nature of droplets to our advantage? Can we use electric fields to steer and to guide these charged droplets? And actually, ToneJet... Um, which I'm going to talk about today, is one situation where we do exactly that. Um, and I'd be interested to know who, who's, who's aware of, of ToneJet, who's heard of ToneJet, and who knows what, what we do. Any, it's good to see some people know about us. Um, and my aim in the next 25 minutes um, is to show you how ToneJet's electrostatic deposition technology um, solves uniquely some of the main challenges of printing on particularly metal packaging in terms of delivering low cost, high image quality and very thin ink layers. And hopefully to convince you that ToneJet has a place alongside other inkjet technologies um, in the complete ecosystem of industrial printing. ToneJet is a very interesting combination of two technologies. On the left hand side, uh, a fairly traditional toner, dry, toner printing technology, generally with dry toner, but sometimes liquid toner, of taking um, toner using a charged image on a drum and transferring it uh, onto, onto paper. Um, on the other side of the screen here, we have inkjet technology, the main focus of this uh, conference, uh, where we take um, most frequently a piezoelectric cavity, uh, we apply a pressure wave to a pulse to, to ink reservoir, and we eject a volume of ink um, through a nozzle. ToneJet um, actually combines these, these technologies together, uh, which is the origin of the name of the company, um, and uses um, electrostatic forces to eject charged inks without any moving parts and without any piezoelectric actuators. Um, and this technology I'm going to talk about uh, in my talk now. Uh, the origins of, of the company are, are from a joint venture between the Technology Partnership and the Research Laboratories in Australia. Um, the Technology Partnership um, is one of the leading consultancy companies in, in the UK. Um, over 300 scientists and engineers. It's been going for about 28 years now and has activities across a whole load of sectors, as shown over here. Um, but has been very involved in industrial printing and inkjet printing of all types uh, over the years. And actually, we heard a talk yesterday from Meteor, TTP Meteor, uh, which is another spin-out from TTP Group, uh, focusing on, um, on drive cards for inkjet printers. Uh, research Labs of Australia um, had over 50 years of expertise in, in toner technology, and particularly liquid toner technology, uh, which was used in many of the early uh, electrographic printing processes. Um, and together, um, these two organisations formed a joint venture which took this technology um, into um, the origins of what we have today. And ToneJet today, um, we do three main things. We provide components of print engines uh, into the industry to enable people to use this deposition technology uh, in their systems. Uh, we enable and qualify uh, the manufacture of ToneJet inks. And we um, work with, with end users to integrate our systems into full end-to-end -end production systems. I'm going to talk um, about the core technology at the heart of, of our ejection process. But in order to go from that technology to 
a product which you can use reliably um, in a factory, we've had to work on, on the whole surrounding ecosystem of supporting system technologies. Uh, we've had to develop inks, uh, we've developed print heads, uh, we've developed the drive electronics, the we've built those into components, uh, we've worked on the image processing um, and in order to take the images and process them in the right way to get the best image quality from this technology. Uh, and finally, we've worked to build systems, which together have enabled us to address some very interesting um, applications, which I'll talk about at the end. But first, um, on to the core technology. Uh, Tonja Inc. consists of a carrier fluid. We use uh, insulating non-polar hydrocarbons. Um, and in that, we disperse uh, pigment particles. We use the conventional pigments used across the packaging sector. Uh, we use a dispersant, uh, a, a polymer or a short polymer chain type material to disperse the carrier fluid, to disperse the pigments inside that carrier fluid. And then finally, um, we add a charging agent to charge those pigment particles um, inside that insulating carrier fluid. And then with that ink, we then need to use an ejection process. And our print head is shown uh, very schematically um, here. We have an electrode, um, which is our ejector electrode. And across the, the front, the face of the electrode, around the electrode, we flow um, this ink. The front face of the print head consists of a, of a second electrode, which we call here the intermediate electrode. Uh, and it has a slot in it, uh, which allows uh, the ejected ink to pass through to the substrate. We drive this print head with some high voltage electronics. And in particular, we maintain um, the front face of the print head uh, at, a, at a high voltage re relative to our substrate. So, in order to prepare the print head for printing, we bias the ejection nozzle, the ejection uh, electrode, uh, with a high voltage, with a bias voltage. Um, this causes um, an electric field to build up inside that head, uh, and that field uh, applies a force to the charged ink and the, and the particles within that ink, and causes the meniscus of the ink to be pulled forward, and the, ink, and the pigment particles in that ink to be concentrated. In order to then trigger the ejection event, we add an additional voltage, a pulse voltage, on top of that bias, and we continue to extend a filament of material forward from the head. Um, and then ultimately, um, as the um, electrical forces overcome the surface tension forces of the ink, that jet breaks up into droplets, which, are, which head towards the substrate. Uh, and then in the presence of that external field um, between the substrate and the head, uh, we are able to accelerate these droplets accelerate towards our substrate. Our substrate um, travels at one meter per second relative to the print head. Um, so we're able to print at about 60 um, linear meters per minute with this technology. Um, the, drop, the typical sub-droplet size is around 0.2 to 0.4 picos. These are small drops, okay, on the scale that we've been talking about this week. Um, and interestingly, one of the things um, said in one of the talks yesterday morning, I think it may be by Ian Hutchings, was that this is like firing feathers um, through air. Um, and we know what inevitable results um, that would have. Um, but this is an example of where actually using this, volt this electric field in the region um, outside the head and between the head and the substrate actually gives us a force to, to keep accelerating um, the, the, the ink as it heads towards the substrate, so to overcome the decelerating force um, of air resistance. Um, this ink lands on the substrate. The ink has a very high solid content. We start off uh, with a high solid content. One of the advantages of this technology, um, we've printed inks of up to about 50% solids. Um, and, um, but actually the process of ejection also concentrates the ink. So we end up with a very high viscosity deposit on our substrate, which is very important for use of non-absorbent substrates like metal, um, where we're able to then allow the ink to dry, um, the residual carrier fluid that's left um, evaporates rapidly, and we're left with our, our dry pigment layer um, on the substrate. Uh, and that pigment um, layer is extremely thin, it's submicron in thickness, and that has a big benefit when we come to talk to metal printing, which I'll talk about later. At Tonejet, we use a, a, a four-process colour system. 
Uh, we also have a white development program, which I won't be talking about today, but it's um, an important part of our R&D. Um, so we build up um, a sequence of CMYK prints on our substrate. Um, we're left, as I say, with pure pigment, very high density, um, high color strength, thin pigment layer. Um, and then in order to protect the pigment layer and to bond it to the surface, uh, we apply an over varnish, an over print varnish coating. Um, this technology actually is common in the packaging industry. So this is not an additional requirement that our technology brings to metal packaging. Um, it's already used throughout metal packaging. So it, we're not adding anything extra in that, in that respect. But this gives us a robust, um, high quality printed layer. We're able to control the density of the, of the ink on the substrate, the, the color density, um, by changing the pulse width which we apply. Uh, the longer the pulse width, um, the more ink in a, 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 per pixel um, we deposit. So we can go between about um, 0.4 and 2 uh, total picoliters um, of ink um, per, um, per pixel. This technology actually um, has some interesting parallels. Um, Electro spraying is an example uh, where high voltages are used to, uh, to form a plume um, of, of droplets. Um, electro spinning is a process where um, electric fields used to accelerate um, a polymer solution from a tip um, and make kind of non woven uh, fibers. And then finally, and perhaps most excitingly, um, we can use this technology to make colloid thrusters um, for um, aerospace. Uh, and actually, there's a, an example of this technology using this, um, this technology to uh, create very high efficiency, very um, precise micronewtons of thrust um, for space satellites. And there's a probe going up um, next month, actually, which, which uses this technology. Um, this has not turned its current focus, uh, as you'll see but it's quite nice to see um, parallels in other industries. But the question is what takes um, our ejection process and, and distinguishes it from a, a colloid thruster or a spinning technology or a, um, a spraying technology, and it's all in really in the ink formulation. Um, clearly the ink formulation, as with all um, technologies, um, really affects the way that the ink droplets form, uh, the velocity uh, and, and, the, and the trajectory of those ink droplets, um, and particularly for us, the way that the, the jet breaks up into droplets. And as I said, we have typically around 0.2 to 0.4 picoliters. The droplets travel about 8 meters per second, um, and our printhead gap is about 0.5 to 1 millimeter um, uh, in, in, in gap. And that's a, uh, an image captured of some droplets um, in flight. Um, the ink I've talked about already, but what's, what's important about our ink is we use conventional pigments, um, which are used already in packaging. Um, we use a binder-free ink formulation. We just print pure pigment. And that's very important in terms of um, the cost of our ink um, and, the, and, and the thickness of the ink layer and the amount of ink we print down. Um, so actually, that gives us a cost of ink, which is very low and significantly lower than some of the competing technologies for printing onto, onto metal. So for a Jinx can, for example, um, we're talking less than a tenth of a, of a euro cent um, for the ink cost on a can. Um, cans have to go through um, some very, very, very tough um, mechanical operations uh, in their life. After printing, uh, they go through a series of necking operations to, to form the, the neck of the can. Um, that process can be pretty tough um, on, on the ink, um, and particularly if the ink is thick, um, as in the case of some UV inkjet inks, um, that, that process can cause cracking and flaking in the area. Um, because we have a very thin ink layer, then that's not um, a problem. And also we get the look and feel of a can that's very equivalent to what we're familiar from an analog print. There's no tactility. Um, of course, tactility can be an advantage in some applications, but, but, but for, for generally um, it's good to be able to mimic the, the look and feel that we're used to um, in a conventional um, analog print. Um, the inks are compliant with, with, with food packaging. Um, our inks are developed at Tonejet. Uh, we have an ink development team uh, and we um, produce our inks um, using a network of supply ink partners under license to Tonejet. Um, the types of things as a, as a printer that we're interested in, of course, are the droplet size, the velocity of the trajectory. From an image point of view, we're interested in the hue, um, the ability to print wet on wet, the light stability, the optical density. And a lot of these factors 
all come from um, the, thought, the, the, the properties of the ink. Um, and this type of slide we've seen for piezo, and many of those properties um, have the same impact for us, but we have additionally to deal with conductivity. And that, and that interplay between conductivity and surface tension um, is one of the key factors in controlling um, the way that our ink breaks up and our ink um, is jetted. And we're able to control that through the selection of materials, uh, through, through the composition of our inks, um, the way we make them, the way we filter them. Um, and, and, and as with other inkjet technologies, it's, it, of course, it's a very holistic um, approach. The inks are designed around the printheads, and it's the printheads which I'm going to talk about next. So this is um, our um, Tonejet printhead, um, and there's a, a printhead you can see on our, on our stand. Uh, we have a 106 millimeter wide array. Um, you'll be able to see on the front there, um, that's the intermediate electrode. And we have a slot that runs along the front of the, of the nozzle plate, of the, um, of the front of the printhead. Um, we don't have nozzles in our, in our printheads, which is actually very important from a reliability point of view. So no nozzle to block. Um, we produce, um, behind that, that letterbox on the front of the head is an array, like a comb of ejector structures, and I'll show a short video which shows that in a minute. And we produce that by a process of casting replication um, from ceramic ma masters. Um, it's actually a very highly precise um, manufacturing process. We make all our print heads in-house, and um, there's accuracies of 5 microns in terms of feature sizes and alignment accuracies um, less, less than that in, in the build-up of our heads. And we use very conventional, actually, um, processes taken from the semiconductor industry uh, and the flat panel industry in the manufacture of these heads. And this is a short uh, animation which shows how we print a beverage can. So the can is rotating uh, in front of our uh, print head. If we remove the electrode structure on the front, we see an array of ejectors. Um, the ink flows over those ejectors continuously. Um, and then when we apply a high voltage to those ejectors, um, we, can, we can eject and deposit ink on the substrate uh, and build up our image uh, colour by colour. So we've taken print heads uh, and we've built those into components that, that customers can integrate into their systems. Um, so we build um, modules which... which, which which take together multiple heads for full color printing. Um, we build maintenance stations for automated um, regular maintenance of the print heads. Um, we produce the all the electronics um, for taking the high data rates um, required for high speed, one meter per second printing um, at high resolution uh, and with high voltages. So we've developed that technology in house. Uh, and also we've, we, we build and develop um, the ink um, handling systems, um, the fluid management systems, which enable us to maintain um, the quality of the ink and to feed it to um, the local reservoir um, at the top of the um, ink head. One of the things which we do in Tonja is, is to really embrace some of, the, some of the more novel and innovative additive manufacturing processes. On the left is a fairly early generation local fluid management system um, about the size of half a shoebox, I guess. Um, and about five years ago, we uh, miniaturized that into a single um, stereolithographically um, assembled piece um, where we have a number of fluid reservoirs and baffles and interconnecting pipes, um, just a few um, external components which are added on, and so we're able to make a much more compact system. It's about the size of a, a pack of playing cards um, and very few components to integrate so it's much shorter assembly time, uh, very compact, and a much lower bill of material. So this is an example of how at Tonejet we like to use um, some of the newer technologies to um, enable us to build compact um, systems. In terms of systems, we do build some smaller systems in-house, um, predominantly for, um, for our customers to assess the technology um, before making a, a deeper investment into larger scale systems. Um, but for the higher throughput systems, we work with our equipment partners uh, to build systems uh, for customers. Uh, and an example which I'll talk about at the end uh, is shown at the bottom there. So I'll come on to applications now. Um, 
Over the years, Tonejet has been used to print actually all sorts of quite challenging materials, um, phosphors, metals, ceramics. We've taken a, um, a decision a number of years ago to focus very much on the packaging sector. The packaging sector is, of course, enormous. The, the market size um, is over 300 billion. Um, it's uh, growing steadily. And one big part of that, which I showed earlier, is, is the beverage can market. 300 billion cans um, produced each year. Um, an enormous market. Uh, and here at Tonejet, we believe that we have some unique advantages, which I've talked about as I've built the talk up. Um, and I'll summarize again here. We have our, our super thin ink layers, our low ink cost, our food contact compliance, the ability to print onto non-absorbent substrates, and actually the ability to print on all sorts of other substrates as well. We can print on paper, um, we can print on plastic, we can print on other materials, um, and actually we can use the same ink to print on any substrate because we've separated out the chemistry of the ink binding um, from the, the chemistry of the ink in terms of its image performance. That gives um, unique advantages in terms of the post-forming I've talked about, the look and feel, and very low running costs compared to some other digital technologies. In addition, we have the ability to, drop, to control volume of droplets. Uh, we typically use an eight-level gray scale, but we can go more than that if we need to. Um, we have no moving parts, so we have very long life print heads uh, and a nozzleless construction um, with high reliability. So together, we have a very low running cost industrial digital printing solution, which is specifically focused and, and optimized for consumer packaging of metal, but has many applications in other materials and beyond. I'll give a case study now of how um, Tonejet technology um, has, is being used and to benefit, and a real meeting of the market need uh, and of what our technology can deliver, and that's in the field of craft beer. Um, some years ago now, Tonejet demonstrated um, the very first digital can decorator, uh, a system that was able to print 120 cans per minute, but 600 dpi. Um, and this opened the way, really, for demonstrating the ability to have a variable image content and short runs of cans. <clears throat> but for us, a very interesting market that's opening up now is the craft beer market. Um, this, this graph shows the number of breweries in the US um, over the years. Starting in 1890, there were about 2,000 breweries. And then a kind of steady decline up to 1980 with a, a very big dip during Prohibition, where I'm sure there were breweries, but they were kept very much undercover. Um, so in 1980, the forces of, of commoditization, uh, of the consolidation in the industry, reduced the number of beers the brewers down to about 90 at the low point in the industry. But interestingly, in the last um, 40 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, in five years, there's been a massive growth in the number of breweries in the US, microbreweries, craft breweries. Um, and, and actually, it's the biggest growth area um, in beer uh, in the US. And we're seeing that trend is spreading um, to other countries. Um, in the US, um, there's a massive move towards putting beer into cans. Um, and that may be less familiar to us in Europe, but, that, but, it's, but we're seeing it coming here too. And the reason for that, um, as, as shown by one of the UK craft breweries, um, is actually aluminium is a very good encapsulant of beer. Uh, as a consumer, we want to protect our beer until we drink it. Um, a can keeps out the oxygen, it keeps out the light, it protects the flavour, and it keeps the beer fresher for longer. And so actually we're seeing uh, in the US um, a huge move towards cans, but actually also in the UK and, some, and other European countries starting to see that trend um, among the craft brewers and really challenging perceptions of the types of beer that go into cans. Uh, but there are challenges for the craft beer market. Um, and really there's a huge mismatch between what craft beer brewers need and what the analog conventional packaging companies can provide. The, um, the analog printing press as well at very high speeds, um, but there's a huge delay time in changing printing plates and setting up new inks, and which, which means there's a big minimum order quantity uh, for can printing, uh, and a big mismatch with the much lower volumes brewed by craft beer brewers who maybe want to have a different can um, for each batch of beer they produce, maybe just a few thousand, a couple of thousand cans. Um, 
There's a requirement, therefore, to buy large quantities of cans to store huge inventories, possibly to have to throw them away. Um, and a big barrier to design variations, and actually one thing that we, we see with a lot of these cans is that, is that the, the craft beers um, are sold with a story uh, and, a, and a vision on, on their can, using the can as a, as a, as a kind of picture of what they, what they represent. Um, and so there's really interesting artwork going on here. Um, and actually, they want to build on that and have as much, tell stories for that artwork with multiple cans with the same, same product. There are some alternatives. Um, shrink wrapping of cans is something that is being done in the US, but that's a very high cost compared to um, the conventional printing technologies. So, so Tonejet um, beverage can printing offers a number of advantages to the craft brewers. Um, there's no, no minimum volumes, there's a very fast response to orders, a lower cost per can for smaller runs, the ability to have variable image data, uh, multiple de designs, um, and just-in-time inventory. Um, so some very interesting opportunities there. Uh, we have a machine uh, which we're just commissioning this week, in fact, um, in Florida. Um, it's for um, it's being built in partnership with a company called Patented Machine Builders in the US, uh, and their customer is BevCam Printers, um, who market themselves as a short-run um, printed beverage can specialists. Uh, this machine produces around 50 to 60 cans per minute uh, and um, up to 200 millimeters um, in height. So you can do large cans as well. And they're targeting the short-run can printing market for craft beer and also for craft soda as well. Um, we have um, additional um, partnerships um, in place with, with other companies um, uh, in Europe um, to deliver machines into the European region. Um, and, and, as, and in parallel to work on cans, which I haven't had time to talk about, we do a lot of work on metal sheet printing um, and on foil printing as well, for example, for the pharma industry. So lots of opportunities um, to use this technology particularly well for, for metals, but we can use it on uh, other technologies as well, other subjects as well. So in summary, um, hopefully I've convinced you that our unique electrostatic technology delivers some, some interesting benefits uh, for consumer printing, particularly for metal packaging. Uh, and rather than staying clear of the charging, we're actually embracing the charging of, of droplets to use that to, to, to accelerate these droplets across the final millimeter um, to the substrate. Um, we've, we've taken the technology from laboratory to factory over the last few years, uh, and we see craft beer as a significant early opportunity um, to showcase this technology um, as we build uh, into other areas. So thank you for listening. Um, we do have, if you're going to imprint um, next month, we have a, um, a booth there, and hopefully showing some very interesting things um, for you to see there. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, I have two. Um, you mentioned that you do not cure directly. You're printing wet and wet, and then the bottle or the can passes outside. Uh, is there any curing needed, and what type of curing is it? Is it UV-based, is it IR-based, or uh, is it happening autonomously? Yeah. So there's no intercolor curing needed at all. We can print directly wet on or wet. So even if the, the previous color hasn't fully dried, we can print the next colour on top of that with, with no problem. Um, the, um, the, the, the residual carrier fluid does evaporate very quickly, but generally in a, in a, in a fast high throughput process, we would apply a short drying stage to make sure that any residual carrier fluid has been dried off um, before we then go through the, the coating, the over varnish coating. And the over varnish coating curing process is, of course, already standard in the packaging industry um, through either hot air or through in, infrared drying. And you mentioned that um, in, in the last slide there for the project, they can do uh, cans up to 200 millimeters in length, but I saw your print head is 106, so I presume you produce longer heads, or do you then move the head up and down, or the can up and down against the head? So that is an excellent question. So um, the approach which we're um, currently adopting um, is uh, to stitch multiple heads together. Um, but um, obviously we're working on new generation things, so just watch, watch this space for where we go in the future. We shall. Thank you. Okay, in that case, one more question over there. So the question was, what, what's the resolution of our print? Um, the resolution of our printing system is 600 by 600 uh, DPI. Yeah. 
If there are no, you have talked about the the long life of the pinhead in terms of billion shots or billion drops. Can you specify something? What I can say is that um, in multiple years of running these pinheads, um, we haven't seen any any printhead failures caused by normal operations um, of a printhead. Um, it's certainly in the years. Um, and um, the usual failure modes, as, as for other, some other linked heads, it, are mechanical failures of a software handling system, which cause a head to be taken out by a big piece of metal, which will happen to anything. But, but in terms of intrinsic stability and lifetime of the heads, we haven't seen in operation any native degradation processes. Um, and that's, you know, a big part of that is the lack of nozzles uh, and the lack of, the lack of moving parts. One final question before we go to lunch. Do you print vertical or horizontal? So actually we, um, we tend to print in the horizontal plane. Um, the inkjet head is, um, is held um, in the horizontal plane while the can is rotated. Um, we, can move, um, we can move that plane around um, up to pretty much horizontal. Um, but, but yeah, as long as the, the main axis is in the horizontal plane. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, okay, that precludes...